The World Bank is one of the world's largest financial institutions, and it consists of five major organizations that are said to represent 188 nations from around the world. Its stated purpose focuses on investing in the development of third world nations and lending interest-free loans to middle and low-income countries. According to the World Bank, there are two goals that have been set to be achieved by the year 2030. These include decreasing the amount of people living on less than $1.25 a day to less than 3% and fostering the income growth of the bottom 40% of every country. Are these goals sensible for the World Bank to accomplish? And more importantly, can they be successfully achieved in the midst of a significant shift in the global currency market? To help us break down the global financial giant known as the World Bank and how you can protect your finances during this seemingly unstable global market, we're joined by Karen Hudas, who is a former senior councilwoman at the World Bank and is the latest in a long string of whistleblowers exposing corruption. Hudes has launched a personal campaign to reveal secrets of the powerful World Bank, and she's been making the rounds on some of the largest television stations and radio shows in the country, including today on WHDT World News. Welcome to the show, Karen. Thanks for having me, Gary. Now, Karen, before we get started, how did you become the lead councilwoman for the World Bank, and how long were you employed there? I was there for 21 years, and I was actually interviewed for the job of general counsel, and uh I told the people that were interviewing me about this cover-up, and they were obligated to end the cover-up, and they did not. Now, before we get into the cover-up, because that's why we want, we're, you're here today to, to blow the whistle on that, uh, but let's talk about the World Bank itself. Most Americans have no clue what the World Bank's purposes or, or its functions are. Can you briefly help our viewers and the American people under, understand what the World Bank does? Yes, it's right in the dead center of the international financial system. And together with its sister organization, the International Monetary Fund, it monitors all of the money of the world, the currencies. Now, the U.S. Federal Reserve has been in control of the United States currency, the U.S. dollar, since 1913. And this this year is the 100th anniversary of its creation. Uh, How does the Federal Reserve and the World Bank work together? Well, the Federal Reserve is, the chairman of the Federal Reserve is on something called the National Advisory Council on International Monetary and Financial Policies. That's supposed to be the oversight agency. The Treasury Secretary chairs that group. The chairman of the SEC is on it. The chairman of the uh, Export-Import Bank, all of the, the Commerce Department, all of the economic agencies of the U.S. government are supposed to be monitoring the World Bank, because it has $180 billion worth of bonds on the capital markets. Uh, They fell down on the job. So the the U.S. regulators are not monitoring the World Bank? They are part of what I call state capture. There is a corrupt group that has actually been called out by the uh, foremost university in Europe called the Federal Institute of Technology located in Zurich, Switzerland, uh, three mathematicians modeled who owned the capital markets, and they found out that there was something they call the super entity, which is pulling down 60% of the annual earnings of the 43,000 transnational companies. And the uh, 10 banks that everybody thinks are separate, like Goldman Sachs or uh, Bank of America or Citibank, They all have the same directors on their boards. They're really, for practical purposes, one big conglomerate. And that group has been uh, thinking that it's above the law, and it's not. So what you're saying is that there's a a supranational banking institution that has board members shared on multiple corporations, so they're basically intermarried banking institutions? That's right. That's how we got the LIBOR scandal. That's how we have manipulation of gold prices and a lot of other uh, nefarious goings on. And anybody in the government that tries to stand up to them, like JFK, for example, gets assassinated. That's what happened to Lincoln, the predecessor uh, group. And when our founding fathers set up their uh, constitution, they knew about this group because there's actually a group behind that group. That's called the Jesuits. And you should read your history books to see what our founding fathers thought about the Jesuits. Well, before we get too deep into all the tentacles of this global cabal, um, 
tell us what exactly you witnessed, what corruption you witnessed while working at the World Bank in your, in your 20 years there. Okay, I didn't know anything actually about what I'm telling now. Um, I was fired illegally in 2007 because I was just doing the job of a lawyer who's working for a company that has bonds outstanding on the capital markets, which is the financial statements have to be accurate, and they were not. Anybody who reported um, poor accounting practices got fired without any recourse because the World Bank is an international organization and you cannot sue it in court unless you're a bondholder. So, now, now, yeah. Now, what, what, what motivated you to step forward with this information? Well, I knew that that was my job, but even before I joined the World Bank, uh, the man who had been the longest serving general counsel, Aaron Brochus, had warned me because he was there when Robert McNamara became the president of the World Bank in 1968. And he said if the president of the World Bank came from the Pentagon, there, there was no way that you were going to get the law enforced. And the lawyers inside the World Bank are the ones that have to enforce the law. So I knew we were headed into um, lawlessness. And the other thing that I knew was there was a very accurate um, model of the politics behind the World Bank. And I knew that if we didn't play by the rules, we were gonna lose our leadership. There's something called the Gentleman's Agreement, which lasted for 66 years, from 1944 until 2010, that the US could simply name the president of the World Bank. And so I warned the Secretary of the Treasury, Larry Summers, who lived just down the street from me, um, because our kids were going to the same elementary school, I warned him, about this. I warned Chuck Hagel, who was then the senator of Nebraska, that we were going to lose our leadership because we were being crooked. And that's exactly what happened in 2010. And this model, once I got fired, warned me that if I didn't keep going and get things back on track, we were going to have a currency war with 90 to 95 percent likelihood. So I kept going. I teamed up with the World Bank whistleblowers. I teamed up with our allies, including Germany. When I went to Senator Luger, I told him that the representative of the German government said that the board was treated like a mushroom kept in the dark and covered with fertilizer. So when Germany asked for its 300,000 uh, tons of gold back in uh, January, and the Federal Reserve told Germany to take a hike for seven years, that's an act of war. So I went back to the Department of Defense. I said, you know exactly where we're headed, and we better head this off. And I've been in touch with all of the governors on this. There's something called the Governor's Council, and Peter Verga is the Assistant Secretary of Defense. I've been working with those 10 governors. I live in Maryland, and my governor is Martin O'Malley. The co-chair of the Governor's Council is Terry Branstead, and I have been in touch with all 50 governors. And we've been working hard. I've been in touch with the county executives. My county executive, Ike Leggett, is the uh, president pro tem of the Council of County Executives. Well, let me, let me jump in here, yeah. because you're obviously speaking to uh, some pretty high-profile individuals. How are they responding when you, when you go with them to the, with these warnings? Well, you know, the um, 188 ministers of finance gathered in Washington uh, just this past weekend, and I went to Ike Leggett's office. Um, because I wanted to have clear instructions so that we wouldn't head into a currency war. You know, the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, have declared that they are not going to use dollars when they finance the trade among themselves. That's 25% of world trade. This is a terrible blow. And so I went to Ike Leggett so that we would be able to calm the markets and to calm our allies. And I had just been on a broadcast that Russia Today TV put out, uh, a 30-minute interview, talking about all of this corruption. And it was very important that we have the proper response. And so when I met with Ike Leggett's office, they told me to go the, to the National Association of Counties, which I did. They also told me to go to the National Association of Governors. I walked into the pension office because um, there's a lot of news that people don't know about. Did you know that your states could not issue bonds or your municipalities could not issue bonds 
because there was no headroom. So I met with the pensions, the, all of the treasurers, the, the office in the National Association of Governors, and I told them that we had to have a concerted approach. And then I went to the uh, World Bank meeting, and I wasn't allowed in. Yeah, I want to talk in. about that because demonstrators yeah. re regularly show up uh, at, at World Bank meetings and protests. One protests in particular against policies of globalization in, in 1999 became known as the Battle of Seattle. Now, in the spring of 2013, you were arrested at a World Bank meeting. Uh, what, what were the circumstances that led uh, to the arrest and what was the outcome? Well, I was arrested illegally. It was because of the corruption that I'm telling you about, because 188 ministers of finance reinstated me. This is because when the Congress approved the capital increase for the World Bank, they put a condition in there. They said, we're not going to disperse the money until the effects of retaliation against World Bank whistleblowers have been eliminated. And Secretary Geithner lied to the appropriations committees back in November. And I went there and I told the appropriations committee and Secretary Geithner exited stage left right after he had finished lying to Congress. So this is a very serious matter. This is contempt of Congress. Um, so when I went in the spring to the annual meetings, I was going there with the backing of the U.S. Congress. I was going there with the backing of 188 ministers of finance to end the corruption. And the reason that the United States citizens do not know this is because of the corruption. These corrupt entities have bought up their media. Now, Karen, and the Americans have been misinformed on very basic, fundamental things about their government. One of the fundamental things that they've been misinformed about is the fact that 49 of the 50 state legislatures have asked for a new constitutional convention. They know about this corruption, and they don't want the consent of the, go of the governed to be denied any longer. We're going to fix this problem. We're going to fix it before the dollar goes down. Now, Karen, you're, you're, you're obviously out there, you're, you're, you're connecting with these people, you are uh, blowing the whistle on corruption at the World Bank. Um, most people end up in a coffin when they go up against uh, the, the global banking cartel. Uh, have you experienced any threats uh, on your life for, or, or any threats to uh, your livelihood uh, for speaking out in this manner? Well, let me tell you, it has been... Um the adventure of a lifetime. I was captain of the NYU fencing team. And I learned that the first thing you want your enemy to do is to attack you because that's when they're on the wrong foot and you come in from the other side. So I had testified in the UK Parliament together with um, Elaine Colville, who's Scottish. We have the law on our side. We're talking about the rule of law. So every time somebody tries to do something, we catch them red handed and we tangle them up and they trip and they fall. So, uh, well, I mean, happened, but have have they have they overtly threatened you in any manner, or are how are they how are how how are they reacting to you blowing the whistle on this? Okay, most of the whistleblowers are in a situation where they're trying to reveal information. I am trying to end a cover up, so I'm in a much stronger situation. And these crooks knew that if anything happened to me, the cover up was going to end. I hired a PR guy, Larry Garrison, and they knew that if anything happened to me, this cover-up was over. So I was in a stronger position. And yeah, they've tried lots of things. I would go to parties and there'd be really, really 